I love our three, two, one, Corinne. I think it's very important. Um, I know people don't get to hear it, but what we do is Corinne does a three, two, one countdown to us pressing the record button and then another three, two, one countdown to us clapping so that we can sync them Slap. all up. Clap. Mm-hmm. Everybody and then I just made hand. us redo everything clap, 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 clap. five times because I think our audio, something happened and I couldn't hear you. So I was like, are we just awkwardly pausing and staring at each other or are we... Is it me? Is it just me or is it both of us? It's both I don't know, of us. But here we are. It's usually both of us. We're usually in sync with two our girls, one mess ghost. up stuff. <gasps> two girls, one ghost. <laughs> I don't know and why this I gasped. Of two girls, one. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> oh my gosh. Shocking. Here we <laughs> are. <laughs> and we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne and I am Sabrina. And what is on your shirt? It looks so fancy. Oh, thanks. Um, it is, I think this is from Urban and it says, It's so cute. Zodiac, but like Zodi, Zodiac. Zodiac. Oh, ooh. I don't know. But it's different Fancy. and I like it. And I've worn this almost every day since I've gotten it last week. I, that it's is really the big and it's best. just so comfy. That's the best. That's the best kind of purchase when you just like can't take it off. I know. It is nice. And I, I've, I feel like I've been really vibing with the t-shirts that like I at first I was stealing my dad's t-shirts but now they just make mm-hmm. t-shirts new that for women that go all the way and touch like your what is this called your like elbow crease your elbow pit the opposite of your weenus I don't know what is it yep your I always think of that tickle pit. the tickle know. game where you like tickle your arm oh, or someone yes, tickles you your like arm this. and you guess it when they get to that point yeah. If anyone yeah. hasn't done that, we have a YouTube, so we'll show you right now. But you basically start with two fingers and you well, like tap, no, someone, tap, 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 tap. But you have Some, to have someone, someone do does it, it to you. you. So imagine I'm doing this so to like if, Yes. Wait, ready? Do and you, then the, I wish I could I do have this. to have my eyes closed. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Oh, I know. I, and then I was trying. the person has to guess when it gets into like your crease. But when you have your eyes closed and someone's doing it to you, you always guess a little too early. It's so it's weird. The sensation. Isn't it? it is. It is. It is the weird. The sensation is weird. I have. Okay. Also, this I was just, happened. just thinking about it. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I want to hear what you have to say too. But I, I, I want to humbly brag real quick because something exciting happened to me this morning. So I. When we first started this podcast, I was like running marathons and I was a long distance runner. That is very far in my past now. But now lately I've been doing (laughs) Orange Theory and I just reached my 250th class, which is also exciting. But then on top of that today, this morning, we ran a one mile and I did it in six minutes and 38 seconds, which is my best time ever. And I'm really proud of it. Holy crap. Sabrina, that's intense. I'm really proud. I think I could never. That's the mileage time that I've always hoped would come out of me if like a tsunami warning came and I was right on the coast. I'm like, got to get in my six minute mile. But I don't think I've ever gone below like 920. You could for sure do it. I've been, I mean, I've been doing this for the last (laughs) year and a half now and I've like built my speed. So I'm, I'm excited. That, that's a huge accomplishment. Thank you. It's just, it's interesting that. That's the fastest that – I mean, I'm a little flustered by it because, number one, I'm amazed <laughs> that you did that. But number two, I'm just thinking, is it because when you're marathon – when you were a marathon runner, you were, like, pacing yourself more, but now yeah. with Orange Theory, you're more focused on, like, short sprints Speed. and endurance? Is that why mm-hmm. you think maybe? Yeah. I mean, it's a very different style of training. Like, when I was running my long distance, occasionally I would do sprinting training or I would do short distance training, but mostly it was long distance And when you're running 26 miles, I mean, there are some people who are, I mean, the fact that I'm bragging about a 638 mile, there's probably people out there. I'm like, oh, I ran a marathon at that speed and I'm going to, yeah, well, F you. Um, Congrats. You rule. (laughs) I suck. But um, (laughs) you don't uh, suck. It's just certain people's bodies are different. Yes, 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 yes. But it's a very different training. So now this is high intensity. I have a friend who ran like 75, a 75 mile marathon. 75 miles? his dad runs 100 mile 100 miles. Yeah, it's like literally overnight. Like you run for like 24 hours. It's crazy. Yeah, see, I, I, it's I, wild. I no. No. See, those are the people who I'm like, don't just stop. I, I felt accomplished running a marathon and now you're making me feel not accomplished with anything. And 
mm, you're just superhuman. I'm just like, are I, your I spleens okay? Like, what's <laughs> Did I tell you the first no, time but I ran a, a marathon, my mom called me and was like, well, I'm not paying for your knee surgery. And I was like, what about like, congrats, you're running a marathon. That's great. <laughs> I think a marathon is a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Especially if someone runs their first one. I, like, I yes. think that's super cool. I, I think so if too. you, Sabrina, ran marathons consistently for 15 years and ran multiple each year, yeah. then yeah. I might say, how are your knees doing? But your first one and only a few, like, yeah. you're fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what were you going to say? you have say? to like, was- stretch and just do all your little things. Yeah. Oh, not important anymore, but I was basically <laughs> just going to say that I think in the beginning when you were like, <gasps> to whisper two girls, one ghost, it's, I feel like you did that because on Sunday night we had our first live on Patreon mm-hmm. with our only phantoms tier and we all went back and, and like basically found when we first started saying our like two girls, one ghost together. And when we started whispering things. Yeah. And it, it didn't come immediately. Like we had some well, the, evolution in the beginning. The two girls, one ghost, we whispered, I whispered right away. But then the see you on the other side. Oh, in the beginning, yes. Was yes, uh, you're an right. evolution. You're right. It was our, our sign off was the evolution. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. And we, I think you and I had a really big self growth moment on Sunday when we re-listened because we both acknowledge that maybe our first episode is not as terrible as we have made it out to be in our own minds. And I think I think it's beautiful that you and I both were able to take a second and be like, you know what? We started something am- amazing. And while, yes, we were young and didn't really know what we were doing, we were novice, we, mm-hmm. we did it and we created it. And l- listening back was not awful it was fun I mean no. there were so it was it's cringy to listen back to yourself regardless but I was I, yeah I'm really right. proud of us yeah the only thing that I was really cringing at though was just I mean we had different microphones because we were just starting out yeah. we didn't invest yeah. in proper equipment because we thought it was just something fun that you and I were going to do together and no one else would ever yeah. listen so we were like ah, we'll just buy the cheap ones that was yeah. the only thing I mean granted we only got 15 minutes in we were all chatting for yeah an hour so we didn't get very far no but yeah you're right it was nice to just be like you know what it's not as bad now I feel mm-hmm. less anxiety when someone's like oh what's your pos- podcast name I always would say okay well first let me tell you before I would say the name I'd be like let me tell you first to not listen to the first episode like start yeah. at 12 or whatever because there yeah. was so much anxiety surrounding it but now I I'm still like, say that choose which choose your own adventure yeah yeah I, I mean still if you want and want to stay with us don't start in the <laughs> <laughs> there's a better chance i mean we see the numbers there's a yeah, lot of yeah there's a drop off, off. For first episode there's a drop mm-hmm. off it's like a yeah yeah it's a significant drop off but i also i, I don't mm-hmm. know if you feel this way but when i'm trying to impress someone like business wise we have created something so incredible but then i feel like when i'm in a business meeting or something and I'm talking about the podcast and they're like, oh, I want to listen. I always, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you don't have to listen. No, 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 don't. Cause I'm just afraid. Like, why? Just join our Facebook group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, like, I uh, think I get don't nervous. Don't listen to me. Just talk to everybody else. Yeah, exactly. One, don't listen to me. But two, I get nervous, I think, because you never know how people are going to deal with the fact that we, you and I, Corinne, are so deep believers of the paranormal and we're like aliens, Bigfoot, cryptids, like ghosts, demons are everywhere. Like we just so full heartedly believe that I feel like someone who is maybe skeptical would take that, uh, like would be a little thrown off by that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's also interesting too that – I. <sighs> I wonder if people in our personal lives after listening wonder if we truly believe or if we're like faking some of it because I I have had some people ask like before they've listened like oh do mm-hmm. you actually believe in that stuff and I'm like I mean yeah like Duh. of course oh my but gosh, I wonder if yeah. anyone if any of our friends thinks I I mean I can't it creeps into every conversation we have outside of the podcast too no one yeah. can possibly Constantly. think that we're not like full deep dive paranormal enthusiasts. Hey, here's the thing that I'm realizing is if people don't believe, I'm just going to make it a mission in my afterlife when I am dead, when I am a ghost, 
when I'm transitioning into a demon, because eventually I'm sure I'll try that out, I will stop by everyone's. <laughs> I I'm will just stop picturing, by. You know when like a snake sheds its skin. I'm picturing <laughs> you like as a ghost, and then all of a sudden you like get all like crispy and crinkly, and like you just slither on out, and then oh you're just, like this like lizard person. Ooh, you're the, you're the demon now. I'll have a cocoon. I'll be that's your I'll evolution. Be a, I'll be a beautiful ghost, and then I'll little chrysalis. cocoon myself in the chrysalis, and come out terrifying. I'm freaking excited. <laughs> <laughs> But I will haunt all those people I'm is what I'm going to say. happy for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Here's supporting my dreams. I, I do. I do. And I think, <laughs> too, when we – I mean, there's nothing we're going to say now that we haven't said a thousand times on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. But I think in our experience, when we've talked to a group of people, if there's like five people and a few people are kind of like very uninterested in talking about the paranormal or really don't believe, there's always one person. There's one person that's like, oh, can I tell you about the time that I'm pretty sure I was haunted or that I got dragged by a demon or that I saw Bigfoot in the yeah. woods? And it's like some of the wildest stories are from the one person in the group that despite all of these non-believers yep. vocalizing their disbelief around them are like, you, you believe I need to tell you my story now. And I like that. I like that there's yeah. that there's so many opportunities for people to just like let go of the fear of feeling awkward talking about it even when they're surrounded by people who yeah. very outwardly don't believe and are just like you believe so you and i together are going to have a moment we're and gonna I need to get this off the chest chat. <laughs> that's the best yeah that is the best we it had is. a i mean we'll get into the episode in a second but you guys you if you're listening to this you've probably been here for a while and you understand that we'd like to chat before we talk about ghosts um we had – remember when we were in Austin and we were walking into the Driscoll and then we ran into those two guys and that one guy was oh, the worst. Yeah. Worst. You guys, we ran into Ew. this – I won't – I mean, I don't I even remember him. his name, but we hated him. And we got stuck in a conversation. His friend was so nice. And like, Corinne, you ended up talking to him for most of it. And I was just like, help me. Because this other guy was such a D-head or A-hole, whatever you want to call him. I want to say those words, but I also – you know, he doesn't even deserve my cursing. Um, he was so awful and was like, oh, like you go chase ghosts and like being so like talking down to us about it and just being yeah, so aggressive. Yeah, but then he would ask you, I feel like it was a very failed version of flirting with you is what he was trying it to was do. It was terrible. It was a terrible question, flirtation. But right before you could answer, he would ask you the next question. And it's like, yeah. you're not even listening. You're just like trying to to like keep me in this weird conversation and yeah, then he was, was really aggressive. gross he's like he was like oh do you ever see like naked ghosts like ghost oh boobs? yeah and then ghost he boobs. said some weird ghost boobs and then remember he said something about oh i can't even he just was yeah, yeah he's not like, like him it it was even his friend was like jesus what are you saying dude yeah he no. was not he was not good and i very i think uh it was very apparent that I did not like him and I made that known. <laughs> you were very, and so then very he clear. tried to be very combative with me and I was like, all right, friend. Back off. You're too immature for me to be a part of this conversation. Yeah. Let's move on. I know you have a crush on my friend who has a big ass <laughs> rock on her finger and is married, but you're gross Back and you off. need to continue on with your friend who's lovely to the bar and leave us alone. You guys, everyone needs so a friend the like demons Karen. in life are a lot nicer than him. Everyone needs a friend like Corinne who will give creepy men wet willies when they're weird to you or say, back off, you're weird and I don't like you and go away. You're you're just the a thing, great person to have around. Well, the, the downside to this though <laughs> is that I feel like I lack some self-preservation when others are in harm's way. So well, whether that that's be like amazing. emotionally. But yeah, I mean, I guess. I haven't come – I haven't been in a situation. This is actually reminding me of – sorry. We're, we'll get to the, the, the stories eventually. But this we're is just excited. When I, when I was at the CVS in Los Angeles that's in uh -huh. – is it in Culver technically? The CVS that's right next to the Trader Joe's off of Sepulveda. It's the one like by the airport? Tiny Trader Joe's and then – sort of, yeah. Oh, well, that's Westchester yeah, still. maybe a little bit. West, okay, in Westchester. Yeah. So I went into that CVS mm -hmm. and there was a man who was quite a few years older than me mm -hmm. who 
didn't look like he was there to shop really and he Mm. cornered me in one of the aisles and asked me some really inappropriate question i think he said like if anyone has kids listening fast forward like 30 seconds right now but he asked me he said something about like oral sex like do you like giving (gasps) oral sex Ew! and he was next to me and i most people i think would have been really scared and like shaken up in the moment and i just turned to him i goes did you just ask me if I like giving oral? And I said it so loud and he panicked. He was, oh, oh, and he was like looking around, like trying to leave. And I was like, this guy just asked me if I like, and I was, oh my I gosh. was crazy. And then I went to the front and, and I was still talking really loudly. And I was like, can someone walk me to my car? Like from the employees. I was like, cause this dude just asked me. I was so hardcore. I love I was so that. hardcore. Well, that's the thing is I never expect you to say oh. anything back. And I'm so proud of you for being, right. one, so loud and making him, like, realize how <laughs> gross of a thing he said to you. Which you this reminds me of. that CBS ever again. No, nor should you. Okay, last week, Akrin, you were the first person I texted after this because I knew you'd be awake. I got grabbed. I got grabbed on the street. Oh, my God, yes. It was terrifying. This is so scary. Tell everybody what happened because this is really scary. Okay. So every morning I walk to Orange Theory. It's about a mile and I like walk the same path every day. I've never – you know, there are people who are experiencing homelessness along the street and I I never feel unsafe. You know, they usually keep to themselves and I was walking and oh my gosh, I I don't know who it was. Someone tagged us on Instagram in this story or like a reel on Instagram. So I like was watching it. I never have headphones oh. in. I would just, you know, had my phone in my hand. I was watching this reel and it was a scary video. And honestly, as the scariest thing is happening, out of nowhere, a man comes up to me and grabs me around my waist. Grabs uh, me. When grabs you texted me. me, I thought he just grabbed your arm, but you were like, no, he like around literally like my waist. around my waist. He tried to kidnap you. I'm just so grateful. Oh, I screamed. Well, I screamed. I said, no. And then I shook him off and he truly just kept walking as if nothing happened. I never even saw his face. He was wearing a hood over his head. No idea who it was. And I was so, I mean, talk about a triggering event. Like it's, it's, yeah, it was, it was, it, I was very shaken. And I also like, was also like, what the heck? How did, what just happened? And I'm also very grateful. There have been, unfortunately, there were a few experiences recently in Santa Monica where like people have been stabbed or hit. And I'm just like very grateful that he didn't have a weapon, but it was very startling. Yeah. So be careful out there, folks. Yeah. Be careful. I know when you told me that I was shocked, but you uh, you've yeah. since walked. Yes, I have. Orange. And also yeah. there was an there was a girl that saw that happen to you, and she yeah. walked with you a little ways. As yeah, well. it was funny. She was like, "I just moved here from New York. I didn't realize that San Monica was like this." And I was like, "Welcome, <laughs> well, welcome <laughs> from one big city to the next." I mean, that's the thing. You just like. <laughs> my mom always taught us too when we were growing up because like small town Vermont, no crime ever happened yeah. basically my mom was like it doesn't matter like you still have to be aware of your surroundings yeah. and it's not to say that you can't enjoy and relax a little bit but you can't just like let your guard entirely down which i think is part of living in the city like yeah. you're always on high alert the, yeah the unfortunate thing for you is like he was not visible and then ran out and grabbed you it didn't yes. even, it doesn't even matter if he was visible and running down the street from you like he could still grab chase you down and grab you maybe not with your six minute mile yeah but well gosh i did not use that yeah now you know scary now i know now i know <laughs> you can Hi. have me if you can catch me leia's very chatty today see late she's stressed out about what happened to you she, she's the also probably like hey can you get to the ghost stories yet it's uh 20 minutes in sabrina who's first i was just going to ask that we have we have a sheet where we say who's first. Let shall me I look. Lo- shall I pull it up? Oh, yeah. You should pull it up because okay. I don't have it up actually. Okay. Neither do I, but I think do, I can do, I can do, navigate do, my iPad do, somewhat do, quickly. Do, 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 don't ask me do, to 
show you any photos on here because my brightness will be down, but I will be able to tell you who's first in one second. Grandma Corinne. technology. <laughs> Grandma Corinne. It's not great. Um, oh, I'm first. Oh, yay. Okay, okay. Put my iPad down. I'm going to relax. Drink my coffee. Did we, did we choose this? I want – so – previously on patreon i mean it's not a part of the tiers anymore because we did a revamp but we're still catching up on mm-hmm. some old patrons who picked out topics mm-hmm. and, oh i think we just picked this though we oh. picked ships ships we wanted to talk about the sea and i think honestly Hi-ho. i think i wrote this in the tracker <laughs> pirate life for the me. ill-gotten booty poppers oh we haven't talked revisit to revisit those old pirate voice <laughs> <laughs> um but i think specifically that i wanted to talk about this because i realized not that long ago that while we have alluded to and in, in short conversations discussed the mm-hmm. queen mary we've actually never covered it i i think you've had this on the excel for years if not more and yeah i mean it's one of the most infamously Probably after haunted like episode 30 or whatever yeah this is i mean the queen mary is one of the most haunted places in the world so i mm-hmm. and i don't know much about it i mean ob- obviously i'm a stone throw kind of away from it but i've never been i don't know much about it i'm so excited here we go well i mean i could have written so much i know i'm sure I stopped myself. So this is going to be a shortened version of Queen Mary's story. Okay. Uh, the ship's story, not actually okay. Queen Mary. Yeah. Um, but alas, let us begin. Okay. So in 1930, Britain began construction on this ocean liner that we now know as Queen Mary because at the time, other countries were pumping out ships, specifically Germany, and Britain didn't want to fall far behind so king george v was like let's build some ships it's always a and competition so began, it is it's like the space race it's literally everything yeah like, everything you have a ship, i want a ship uh, is that regina george where army whatever it is so i yeah well he saw germany building ships so he wanted ships and that is what britain did they started to build some ships And the construction started almost immediately on this 80,000-ton luxury ship. It cost, in today's money, over $350 million to build. What? And I know. Isn't that crazy? I was thinking about it. I was like, how do people make money off of ships? Yeah, that's like I have no idea. The cruise line industry is so huge. But, like, how do they they make money? Bottomless drinks. You got to pay for the uh, yeah, I guess all inclusive. Actually, that it, because, honestly, uh, it's such a good deal. If you have like two drinks a day, it makes sense because I recently went on a cruise, so I don't know how they make money. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know either because think about how many people have to work on the ship, how many people yeah. have to service the ship in between. There's just yeah. so much equipment. It's kind of like an airplane; like they don't last a long time. There's no ship that's like out there for eighty years. Yeah. Without being retired or having a shit ton of work done. To, I I don't know. Math is not my strong suit. Neither is the economy <laughs> or money. So let's just move on but and learn ghosts, about ghosts. <laughs> ghosts, you, you are very strong in that subject. <laughs> Conspiracy theories. <laughs> I got you. SpongeBob quotes. Here I am. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this boat cost a shit ton. Don't know how they made money. But Britain was in the habit of, at the time, and I think probably still, of naming its ships female names that ended with IA. So rumor has it it was supposed to be called the Victoria. Mm -hmm. But other people who had been working on the ship and were involved in the project were like, oh, we just think it would be so nice to name it after Britain's greatest queen, Mary, who was King George's wife at the time, Mary Tuck. So I am like, curious. Okay, we'll name it. Why? Because I feel like every ship is referred to as a she. Like they're all feminine. Why? I don't know. That's is it because question. it was mostly men sailing on them and they wanted a feminine presence? Or is it like, is there some weird sea goddess who they would associate ships with? I'm curious. If anyone knows, let us know. Right. Or I'm even thinking about just like, 
language and you know how in, in many other languages there's feminine or masculine words like oh, i'm thinking specifically like spanish yeah, i wonder like, if maybe somehow it was converted over and then huh. just had I, again i don't know Here's we, don't the thing, know. we don't know we're asking questions we don't know <laughs> and we're not looking it up no so. <laughs> we're busy we're busy telling you about the Queen Mary. So the RMS Queen Mary was created. It was a top luxury liner. It shuttled people across the Atlantic primarily. Um, and as I was as I was reading about it, I was like, this feels very Titanic. Like the way that it was written about feels very Titanic uh, because it had this, it was this premier and extremely luxurious transatlantic ship with beautiful decks, romantic wood paneling, art deco details, State of the art, everything for its time. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is so Titanic esque. And then as I kept reading, it said that if you think it sounds like the Titanic, it's because the Queen Mary is the same kind of transatlantic ocean liner as the Titanic and aesthetically was built very similarly. Oh. So I feel which like this one, is which one close. came first? Titanic. Okay. Okay. Titanic. Yeah. I think people had already died on the Titanic. Yeah, yeah. That time this thing Dates was built. are just not my expertise, so. Well, I'm probably wrong too. So, but I'm <laughs> you're probably certain. right. Yeah, no, I believe it. I think the tragedy of the Titanic happened before World yeah, War II. Yeah, yeah. Right? Wasn't it in like the early 1900s or late 1800s? I'm gonna Based sound on costumes. Dumb. Yes, Based yes, on yes. Clothing, it yes, definitely you're, you're was right. before 1930s. It was like <sighs> Victorian, Edwardian, something like that. Gosh. Okay, okay yeah. Uh, so the ship, it lived. It was very luxurious. Everyone was like, ooh, I want to be on the Queen Mary. And so it did have some big names aboard it at certain times, like Winston Churchill, mm. Elizabeth Taylor, Greta Garbo, and Walt Disney. Mm. It then eventually helped with World War II, which was happening only a few years after it was created. So the Queen Mary was painted gray. It was then nicknamed the Gray Ghost. Ooh. And its job was to ferry soldiers to the front lines. And this is one of the instances when disaster struck the ship because it collided with another ship, a smaller ship. And the tragedy of it is it's not, it wasn't even in battle. Like it, they were on the same team. But basically what happened was the Queen Mary was escorting 10,000 American soldiers and it was zigzagging on its course. And this was normal, especially for large ships to do because it was kind of trying to like trip up any other yeah. ships that were like maybe trying to target it. You know, like a little zebra zigzagging from a yeah. lion. So that was a normal thing. So it was trying to confuse people in ships nearby who were thinking about attacking. And then the Curacao ship was much smaller. It was escorting the Queen Mary, protecting it from incoming attacks, but this ship was going straight. And this ship was a little bit older, so it was going slightly slower than the Queen Mary was at, in Queen Mary's zigzag. So they both appeared to be heading towards each other during the straight and zigzagging moments. However, Queen Mary's captain was like, no big deal, no big deal. Curacao will move. They're used to escorting big ships like us. And then the captain of Curacao, I don't really know. He was just like, oh, oh, this is much closer uh -oh. than I thought it was. And now it's way too late for us to take a really sharp turn and avoid uh. colliding. So the Queen Mary, which will house like 12,000 people. Yeah, it's massive. Hit, this, hit like a 400 person boat, sliced it in half immediately. 337 people died. There oh were only 101 gosh. survivors. Sliced it and in at half. at the time, sliced it in half, just cut right through it. Horrible. Oh, my gosh. The captain survived and 100, 100 other people, but 300-some people lost their lives. Wow. And what's also, I imagine, so terrifying to go through is at the time, because World War II was actively happen happening, there was protocol that – Ships were not allowed to stop sailing. So Queen Mary couldn't stop to help everybody in Curacao. Oh, oh my They had 10,000 soldiers. They were a huge target. They couldn't stop. They couldn't stop? So they had – no. They had to keep going. And the captain radioed for help for Curacao. How, so how did the 100 – however many people survive from the other ship? Just lifeboats? I don't really know. I don't know if they were in lifeboats or – 
or if they were just kind of like floating in water. But it said it took hours for other smaller boats yeah. to come and rescue them. And by then, there was only 100 some survivors. Oh, my gosh. That is it's horrible, horrible, really horrible. Brutal. I was going to make yeah. a comment. I'm still going to make it, but it's not as enjoyable to make now because this is such a tragedy. But when you were talking about the collision during, not even during battle, it made me think of, I played ice hockey for a year in high school and um, I was in practice and a girl didn't know how to stop and collided with me. I went flying backwards and got a concussion. Ooh, ooh. That's not good. How many yeah. concussions have you had? Only one that I know of, thankfully. That's good. How many yeah. concussions are you allowed to have in your life? Uh, I don't think even one is good, but I don't I don't know. I think there's like different sports have different rules of how mm. many make you unqualified to actually play anymore. I've had three. So you had I think three? if I have another one, I'm going to – How? Not. One was at, at, at our college at LMU. We had something called lip sync. Wait, no, that's how I broke my rib. Oh? Let me let me re remember. Cringe. See, I don't even See, remember. See, you can't even. What is wrong? Oh no. Wait, maybe I've only had two. We've lost her. Mm, maybe I've only had two. I can't really remember. One was. I was at a high school party and we were all dancing on someone's coffee table and I was on the end and someone oh. like booty bounced me off and I went back and hit the fireplace mantle. Oh my gosh. On the back of my head and like the, the doctor said I should have blacked out because it was like a type two concussion, but I was awake still. And then the other one was drunk and we were, I was also at a height. We were in Cabo spring break and there were, remember at, Squid Row, how there's those yeah. bleachers and everyone stands on them. Again, oh. some booty bounced me off and I fell and hit my head. Maybe you should stay away from booty bouncing. I know. Okay. Correction. I've had two concussions. I've broken my ribs three times. That's what I was thinking. The three. Concussions. Grin. Your medical chart is off is uh worrisome. <laughs> I'm glad you're okay. It's just incredible because like my center of gravity is so low. It's literally only when I'm inebriated that I get injury yeah. or just I mean, like that makes sense accidents yeah but otherwise i've had i've literally had someone biking at like 15 miles per hour run straight into me and they fell off their bike and i didn't even like waver like i was just steady anyway shocking that drinking is dangerous <sighs> in uh, new news mm -hmm. drinking is dangerous and sabrina's had one concussion from ice hockey so she quit this just in <laughs> this just in what are we talking about? The Queen Mary. <laughs> Queen Mary. <laughs> okay, so horrible that this happened. Such a big tragedy. But for the most part, this was, I think, the only major, major disaster that happened. Well, okay. I mean, I'm sure there was more. But like in terms yeah. of this many deaths and being on the same right. side in the war and whatnot, this was, yeah. this was like the big thing that happened in Queen Mary's life. But there were plenty of other smaller disasters and individual deaths on board. Nearly 50 people have been reported or rumored to have died on the Queen Mary, from crew members dying in the boiler room to a little girl drowning in the first-class pool. Oh, jeez. In 1967, the Queen Mary sailed its very last voyage to Long Beach, California, where it took up permanent residence – it's still there today – and mm -hmm. it's floating in the port. In 1971, it opened as an aquarium and museum, but it did not do too well, and so it changed owners and management companies quite a few times. And then this is something new that I did not know about what? the Mary. Do you remember earlier when I was like, oh, it had celebrities and famous people and all these like luxurious first class people yeah. like Walt Disney? Okay, Walt Disney... So he took a trip on the Queen Mary, and this inspired him to attempt to make a haunted mansion on the sea on Queen Mary. Did you know about this? I did not know about this. What? Okay, me neither. Yeah. It existed when we were alive and we never went. Oh, it was, uh, how old were we? When was it? We were like three. Oh. <laughs> we never remembered anyway. Uh, okay, but it operated in the 90s. So he opened Port Disney on the Queen Mary, which operated in the 90s. And on the Queen Mary, you would take a tour of the old ship and you would be guided by a celebrity guide, which were actors impersonating 
a celebrity who had traveled aboard the the Queen Mary oh, on one of its cool. voyages. So like someone might dress up as like Elizabeth Taylor or something. Right. You so know, it's interactive. Kind of like the pr- yeah. princesses and, and yeah, yeah, different people at Disney. There were themed parties. There were high-end retailers, just many attractions. I mean, it was it was basically a theme park, but like on the so Mary. cool, yeah, so cool. The main attraction was Haunted Passages. It was a tour that brought you through the legends, the mysteries, and the tragic stories attached to the ship. And on the tour, people were brought to the sites where crew members had been crushed, where people had been murdered, where passengers had been drowned. It was like literally, it was like. Partially a themed attraction meets actual like ghost tour. Whoa. I mean, for for someone like Walt who created these magical happy worlds, it sounds like he also had a very twisted mind. Yeah. I mean, didn't he didn't he like freeze his body? Isn't he frozen somewhere trying that's to That's like back a away? The, that's a conspiracy. Yeah. Oh. Well, I bet he is. <laughs> I believe <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so on this tour, you would stop at room B340. Disney installed special effects here. So the floorboards, when you were there, it was kind of like when you would go through the Haunted Mansion, you know how there's all mm-hmm. the like ghosts and pianos playing themselves and stuff like that. Yeah. So this this is what they installed into this room. So you heard all of the horrible things and the mysteries and the legends and the deaths that had happened. And then you stop at this room and the floorboards are creaking. The faucets will turn on. There's disembodied voices that echo. The mirrors reflect paranormal activity in them. Ooh. So super, super cool. Mm-hmm. And similar to the ghosts in the haunted ride, haunted mansion ride, the ghostly projection of John Pedler, who was a young engineer who had been crushed to death on the ship. Oh my god! Uh, was made into this projection, and his his like being, his person was displayed in the boiler room as if you were standing there. I just imagine the ghost of John Pedler being like annoyed by that and then haunting additionally. I mean, he does haunt there. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, can you imagine? Or just like almost having fun with it where it's just like when you know the projector, once you sync up the cadence of the projector and yeah. the score is going through, like when it's not actually there or like trying to go with the projection and then as soon as the yeah. projection turns off, you're still there and you're like, boo! That would be fun. That would be fun. That would be fun. Oh, I just got like excited chills from that. I know. Like the, I, okay. This is the- Being a ghost, I shouldn't say this. Sounds <laughs> fun. It does sound fun. I have always said when I die, I don't care what happens to me. Just throw me overboard, feed me to the sharks, scoop out yeah. whatever you need, put me in. I don't know. I don't I don't care. I do care now. Sabrina, I want – well, I guess it doesn't really have to do with my body. I want a projection of myself to be played somewhere so that my ghost can interact and I can prank people. Okay. Good to know. So it's like I will set that up. everyone goes to see the ghost – of me and then like it truly is my ghost sometimes but it is you okay all right well yeah we'll have to write this up in your will okay. it'll be a but i don't want to be anywhere normal i want to be like a batman projection in the sky above boston oh my gosh yes and when the clock strikes three thirty-three, just for like 60 seconds i just float on I'm through up in the I'm sky like a little sperm just wobble around <laughs> the sky. That's what I want. A little sperm. Okay. Blue, Noted. Blue, 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 blue. This is everyone. Yeah. Keep me. Hold me. I mean, God willing, it doesn't happen anytime soon. But this is <laughs> hold me on record. This is on record. I'll hold and, you accountable. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You can haunt me until I do I'll that. Haunt for you. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So legend grew around this room that Disney had turned into this sort of attraction this theme park at sea uh and eventually it does close down it didn't surprisingly it didn't take well in long beach which i'm like who wouldn't want to go there this seems like the best thing in the world yeah however people didn't so it closed down and they locked up room b340 where it remained sealed for decades and the legend just just grew even more and more and more after this room Mm -hmm. was sealed and the attraction closed down 
So after so many years, the stories of Disney's fake curated hauntings and the real hauntings aboard Queen Mary started to bleed together. People's memories of the park and retelling of their paranormal encounters sort of kind of meshed and people didn't really know uh, where the authentic spirit interactions began and where the sort of like morphed misdemeanors of Disney's lighting projections ended. Um, Fair. So – some stories that people might hear or retell are are kind of a, a blend of the two. But what we do know for sure is that this ship, Disney or no Disney, is very haunted. So yeah, let's it get is. Into the hauntings. Yes. Starting in stateroom B340, the one that was closed for some time. Long before Disney came along, this room had a dark past. A 1948 British third class passenger, Walter J. Adamson, passed away in the room, cause of death unknown. Then, 22 years later, in 1966, a woman staying in this room woke up as the bed she's ripping pulled off of her. She wakes up and she looks to the end of her bed and there is a man standing there before her. So she screams, she phones for the steward, and the man in front of her at the end of the bed just vanishes into thin air. And so now Ooh. people will, despite it being closed off for many years, they have reopened it. And Queen Mary, if you didn't already know, is a hotel. So people will request to stay in this room to try to get some extra creepy paranormal encounters. Wild. And maids often find the bathroom water running, even when no guests have stayed there to turn them on prior lights will turn on mysteriously and in the middle of the night there will be knocks on the door that will disrupt guests the mayfair room is the next haunted location on my verbal tour for you it was once the beauty salon and now it is an office so in 2001 an employee from the accounting department came in cracking on 5 30 a.m she's like i'm getting to work early i'm getting out of here early so she yeah. gets on and she's like the only one. I mean, it, there's plenty of other people aboard the ship. It's a hotel. Other people are working. She's not solo. But in these in this office, she is. She's the first one on. And she said as soon as she went into the space, it just felt off. But she was like, ah, I'm going to brush it off, go about my day, get going. Right. So she sits down at her desk and then she feels this really cold air around her and someone brush against her chair. She turns around. There's no one there. She's alone. However, just a few minutes later, she spots a translucent figure walking across the office and floating through the door. So wow. she got up and ran until other workers <laughs> came. She did not work until the next person clocked there. in for the day. Wow. Yep. Very fair. Okay, I'm going to really butcher the name of this room, but there's a room okay. called the Mauritania room. <laughs> I probably wrote it down wrong too, but M A U E I T A N I A Mauritania room. It's haunted. I believe you. And yeah, okay. In 1989, two employees were cleaning the lounge room because this room was basically used as a lounge for like VIP guest check-in. And so mm-hmm. they were in there, they were cleaning, and in the middle of the dance floor, there's a passenger just sitting on a chair staring at them. And they're like, this is really weird and awkward. Well, let's just clean around this person and like not make eye contact, like awkward guest. And so they're trying their best to ignore the creepiness of this person. And then a third employee comes to start helping cleaning. And this employee looks over at the passenger that's in the chair. And the passenger looks at her and is like, can you please move? Actually, I'm not sure if he said please, but he just said, can you move? And she was like, what is happening? And so then the other two women are like, Oh, this is this is not okay. We need to call security. So as they dial, the three of them are calling security about this like weird passenger guy that keeps staring at them. Yeah, and trying to talk to them. And as they're making the phone call, all standing there together, staring at him, he just fades. Oh my gosh! <laughs> what a bossy ghost! I know, I know, and also. I'm assuming that internally, like the internal structure of the Queen Mary hasn't shifted. Perhaps the purposes of the rooms have, but 
if this was a ballroom and a dance floor, I kind of presumed that it always was because how many spaces on the ship are still right. that big. So it's kind of interesting to think of him just like sitting in a chair in the middle of the dance floor. I mean, it could have been something military related, though. Oh, yeah, you're right. They probably used that for something else. Right. Just piling in. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, regardless. Okay. Now on to the first class swimming pool. So remember, this was a luxurious way of traveling. The majority of guests did not have a first class experience, but the people that could afford it did. And there was a pool that is now abandoned due to not meeting California code. Uh, But there was a pool that was for first class passengers only. And it had this beautiful fountain. It had a mother of pearl ceiling, elaborate mosaic tiles. I feel like it was really big. Received listener stories about this before. So I'm picturing it perfectly because someone sent us a photo before. Okay, yes. And so I actually, so I re listened to, I think it was like episode 30 or something, because we had read a listener story from someone who had sent in a Queen Mary experience. And I wanted to retell it, retell what I had heard in this episode. So I had to go back because I knew I retold it in that episode when we were talking about that oh story, which was the fact that I went on a tour of the Queen Mary and my guide had told – the tour guide had told me stuff that happened – well, told all of us, not me directly, oh. but like told the tour group stuff that had happened in the pool. So I wonder if that's what you're remembering. Maybe. But I'm yeah. sure a ton of people had experiences from the pool too. Yeah. Sorry. I said – probably 120 extra words you did more than what i needed to to describe that to you but it was it was a fun mind game for me to follow along <sighs> yeah me too it's kind of like where am i going with this <laughs> what am i trying to say? blame the concussions it's the con- i've had two concussions and i broke my ribs three times and <laughs> barely alive point being is there's a pool that's Very beautiful, now abandoned, and it is pretty creepy. And so a young girl is said to have drowned in this pool, and her spirit is thought to still be in this area. However, there are heaps of other spirits around the pool. People have seen a young woman in a tennis skirt walking down the stairs and then disappearing Mm. behind a pillar. There's a little girl in a blue and white dress who pops up and then disappears in the blink of an eye. And there's a woman in an old wedding gown that is accompanied by a little boy in a suit. So they were clearly going to a wedding, her wedding. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. I'm very curious about that. Okay. So now, like I said horribly before, I went on a tour of the Queen Mary about five or six years ago. And during this tour, we had this amazing tour guide who just told us so many extra stories. And he was just like really goofy and Anytime there would be like a really intense story and everything would be really quiet and everyone's sort of like exploring the different areas, he would just scream at the top of his <laughs> lungs. Like he would just be like in silence being like, I wonder where there goes. And he'd be just like, ah! And everyone would jump and it was so, it was so scary. But he was awesome. And That's he told us when we were in the pool, because they bring you on the haunted tours, they bring you into the abandoned pool area. He told us about an experience that he had. So... On the tour, you go visit here, and for the most part, it's generally a creepy place, and so most employees avoid the place Mm -hmm. that is the pool unless they have to be there, but it also does happen to be a shortcut between the employee lockers and the exit, so occasionally, employees will zip through it solo from time to time, even though the energy there is off. So he said that's what he was doing. He got off, and he was just trying to zip on through, get out of there clock out and be done for the day so he goes through the pool and he hears footsteps run into the bathroom slash changing room area so he's thinking one of his co-workers is trying to play a prank on him or someone's mm-hmm. trying to scare him so he's like nope not gonna let this happen he then goes to find them goes into the bathroom and he's like kicking with his foot pushing each door open the, oh my the stalls to the bathroom and looking in Gets to the last one. His heart is now – he's, like, shitting himself. Heart pounding. Opens it. There's no one. Ah. So he's now, like, oh, my God. Am I having a ghost experience? Is this paranormal activity? So he just tries to really calmly, like, collect himself. Maybe he just heard yeah. something. Maybe it was an exaggeration. He's just uh, imagining it all. So he then walks out and starts making his loop around the pool towards the exit. And as he's doing this, there are footsteps happening behind him. Like, someone's <gasps> following him. Oh my so then gosh. he turns around, 
No one. He continues again. The footsteps now are happening again, but just a little bit out of sync. So he knows it's not just his own footsteps echoing. Right. And they're closing the gap between him ooh, and them. Ooh, so ooh. whoever it is is getting closer and closer. He said that he has never run so fast in his <laughs> life when he realized that they were gaining yeah, on him. Yeah, so creepy. So creepy. Uh, he also told us, and this I couldn't find online, but I remember him telling us that there's this one sitting room right off of the lobby where guests will often see people seated at the piano. Um, or they'll see someone seated at the piano maybe playing or they'll hear piano music only to then realize after that it's actually a spirit and there's no one there. And there's also a stairwell right near there that's pretty steep. I mean, a lot of them are. It's like an old chip. So Mm -hmm. you can easily fall. So you have to like grab the handrails. But people do stumble and trip sometimes. But there's this one specific stairwell where – Many people have reported feeling a supportive hand on them as they wobble and stumble and try to regain their balance. So there's someone oh. literally saving people. That's from really kind. Down the mm-hmm. Wow, I know. that's a Isn't nice that spirit. Nice? That's a very nice I wonder spirit. Who it is. Super yeah. nice. Uh, and then there's just a few more haunted spots for you. So in Boiler Room Four, there's a little girl that's been seen numerous times, sometimes sucking her thumb and Aww. sometimes carrying a doll with her. Which is Poor girl. And then lastly, there's hatch door number 13, known as Shaft Alley, which is the site of a gruesome death. In 1966, the door in the engine and boiler room needed to be closed, and a crew member went to do just that when somehow he got trapped. His (gasps) arms were pinned to his side, and he was being crushed by the heavy metal. Five minutes later, an employee finds him, is able to free him, Gets him to the hospital, but it was too late because his body had literally been crushed. So he had internal bleeding everywhere. He's bleeding out of his nose. It was it was awful. No, no, no. So he died shortly after, and he was only 18 years old. That's so sad. And his spirit remains in this area. People see him. People have greasy fingerprints (gasps) appear on their faces. They sometimes they don't like even know they're having an interaction, but then they'll have like his fingerprints on them Whoa. after leaving and realize that he touched their face. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. People hear him running up behind them and whistling. And he, again, like I said, some people see him. He will appear as a full-bodied apparition with a beard and blue coveralls, wandering the halls, asking people if they've seen his wrench. Oh. Yeah. There are, I mean, I'm remembering some more stories from the tour too. There's just so much that happens here yeah. and there's so many spirits and so, so, so many more paranormal encounters. But these are just some of the main spirits and haunted spots aboard the right. RMS. Queen Mary. Mm-hmm. And now a floating hotel with restaurants, parties, paranormal tours. You can go visit the Queen Mary. You can stay overnight. You can have your wedding there. And maybe I'll be lucky enough to encounter the spirits within um, it is temporarily closed at the moment. Okay. I think they're restoring some things, but mm-hmm. I'm sure it will open again and uh, we'll, we'll be able to I want to go hunt some ghosts. Should we – I'll go with you. Yeah, I was going to say we should add that to our road trip where we stay. We, like, need to stay there. Okay, I'm down. I'm down. Yeah. I liked the Queen Mary. Okay. I liked it a lot. There was Great. also – I can't remember if this is – I'm remembering on the tour that we went into like the hull of the boat and I don't remember if there was any paranormal Mm -hmm. activity there or if it's just generally creepy because it's like entirely pitch black. Yeah. But that part was super creepy. We have to take the tour when we go, the paranormal one. We'll do all of it. Yeah. It is so fascinating. I mean, like if you think of sea travel, the amount of time you spend in a confined space, like even in the beginning of the pandemic when cruises or when COVID hit, like cruises were – You had like they were stationed out in the sea and they couldn't dock because Mm -hmm. and then like the virus was spreading in just in the ship. It's a lot of people died because you just couldn't escape. If one thing started spreading, you couldn't escape it. Like you were confined in this space where it was spreading. It's so crazy just to think about the people that were during COVID. Yeah. On cruise ships. Yeah. 
like stuck in their rooms or just like the crews that were like 20 people that were on like the Disney cruise liners or whatever. And they yeah. were just like hanging out, like tanning on the decks, <laughs> chilling, doing like the TikTok dances together. <laughs> I know. I Yes. I don't think Wild. it was as enjoyable as that made it seem, but that that might be what up there with my oh, like, sh- worst yeah. fears of getting stuck on a cruise ship. Like that, I think also the time at to- sea is so similar to – being a lighthouse keeper. Like there is such an isolation to it that I imagine mm-hmm. if you got stuck out there, you would go a bit mad. I almost think it's better though to be stuck on land than it is. Sea. That's what I mean. To be just a housekeeper, like you at least get to explore. You get to like oh, yeah. be with nature. You get to wander and explore, but like you but just there, go through the same. Yeah. There are some the lighthouses constantly. though. I think we did an episode of this a long time ago, but there was one lighthouse like in the middle of the ocean and being a lighthouse keeper there would be miserable. It's kind of like the movie. Did you ever watch the movie like The Lighthouse with Willem Dafoe no, and Robert Patterson or Pattinson? Robert Pattinson. Yeah. So it's Nick and I watched it and got in a fight afterward because we were like felt so weird. Like it, it was such an unsettling movie that we were at like we felt off watch after watching it. Really? Yeah. I really need to watch it. So many people have told me to see it. It's weird. It's worth watching, right? It's weird. Yeah. Weird. Weird in a good way? I would not watch it again. It's fascinating. Mm. Uh, But it was, yeah, the way it made me feel was, you know, know, I don't want to feel that way again. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Maybe I'll watch it. Maybe not. Yeah. But yeah, isolation. Scary thing. Although sometimes I desire it again. (laughs) I desire it by choice, not by Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Force. By choice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, just because you and I are always often in sync in a weird way, I have a different Mary ship to talk about today. The and Marys. The Marys. The Marys of Sea at Sea. Mary on, I don't know. The Marys at Sea. The Marys at Sea. Okay. The sweet, so- the sweet life of Mary and Mary. <laughs> Okay, I'd watch this show. So thank you real quick to Natasha from our Patreon for giving this suggestion because if you didn't know, if you're a Patreon donor, we, well, I would say Corinne, Corinne posts ahead of time a (laughs) teaser of what our episode topics are going to be and we take suggestions from our Patreon donors. So Natasha suggested the Mary Celeste. So everyone, grab your lifeboat, buckle your life vest because we are going to be on a tumultuous, stormy ocean as we discuss Mary Celeste. On November 7th of 1872, Benjamin S. Briggs, his wife Sarah, and their two-year-old daughter and their seven crew members departed the New York Harbor on the Mary Celeste. Their destination was Genoa, Italy. Just one month later, on December 5th, a passing ship called De Grazia spotted the Mary Celeste at full sail adrift off the coast of Azores with no sign of the captain, his family, or his crew. The crew of the De Gratia boarded the ship looking for signs of life and found absolutely nothing. No one was aboard, and aside from a few feet of water in the hold and one missing lifeboat, the ship was undamaged and still loaded with six months worth of food and water. So what the Where heck happened? did the people go? Happened? That is the question. What happened to Briggs and his family and the crew? Where did they go? And how in the heck did they vanish without a trace? That is what Wait, we're going to talk about. Wait, where, sorry. Where were the people from? Where was the original boat from? Uh, they left the New York Harbor and were heading towards Genoa, Italy. Wow. Okay, yeah. Well, because I'm just thinking like the Azores are out in the middle of nowhere. That's basically like yes. happening upon Hawaii. Yeah. I mean, I think Which it was is part like of their path. But like – But – but the there's fact like that they so much ocean around that. Like, yes, you, you're either there or you're traveling another, you know, yes, ha- 10 hours at sea plus. Yes. It is a befuddling mystery. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of conspiracies, which I know are your favorite, Corinne. So um, before we talk about all those, let's discuss the history of the Mary Celeste. So. The Mary Celeste was built in Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia, and launched under British ownership 
and it was initially called the Amazon in 1861. She was constructed of locally felled timber, which I think is amazing that they were, you know, instead of cutting down trees, they were like, oh, let's only use ones that have fallen by themselves. What's fallen. That's beautiful. Right. That is really um, nice. It had two masts and was rigged as a brigantine. And I just want to be very clear to everyone listening. I know nothing about ships. I don't know the bow, the stern. I've never sailed. I'm not like, I don't know. So I wrote this because the internet told me about this, but I, and I even looked up like, what does this mean? And I still, um, don't comprehend. So boat people, sorry. Anyway, the, the Amazon later known as the Mary Celeste was 99.3 feet long and 25.5 feet wide with a depth of 11.7 feet. Um, her maiden voyage was in June of 1861, and she sailed to five islands to take cargo of timber across the Atlantic to London. And in much of my research, it said that nothing really eventful or wild happened to the Amazon until the disappearance of Benjamin Briggs and his whole crew. But, 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 but I would insist that a curse was had befallen the ship from the very beginning because the ship's very first captain, Captain McClellan, actually fell ill after supervising the first voyage and died 19 years later. So the first captain died. Oh. Or sorry, ni 19 days later. He died 19 days later. Did I say years? I meant days. Yeah. Days later. Yeah, 19 and days then, later is definitely a little bit more cursed. Like a little different. Years. Yes. Um, <laughs> And then life happened, and then he died. And then he died. <laughs> but it must be a curse. Yeah, no, no, no. no 19 <laughs> days. Like, he he basically was – he died – I don't know if it was on the ship, but it was big, part of the voyage. Like, he was still the captain of the ship, and he died. Mm. And then the captain who took his place actually had a ton of issues with navigation. And I didn't do a ton of research. Like, maybe he was a little bit of a drunk. I don't know. But he ran into a lot of things with the ship. He, like, ran into fishing equipment. He ran into another ship. Like, this guy truly sank another ship in the English Channel. So I think it was a problem with him. But considering the the history and what continues to happen to the Amazon, a.k.a. the Mary Celeste, it is curious and interesting that yeah. the first two captains are having a lot of trouble. I mean, and a boat that's 100 feet long, that's a big boat, but it's it's not it's not unmanageable. No, no. I mean, think about it. It was a a seven person or eight person crew when everyone just went missing. So it is a smaller ship. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about like my parents' boat. It's 25 feet. I drive it all the time. I mean, yeah. I know four times that size is way bigger. <laughs> but, <laughs> a little bit. But yeah. still, I'm just like in, in Boston, I'm thinking about all the boats that are going through the channel and there are some that are so yeah. much bigger than that. So yeah, yes, you're right. Definitely. It is befuddling. The fettling. So the Amazon at this time had an ill-fated beginning. At least I believe that. And then in October of 1867, the Amazon was washed ashore during a terrible storm. She was so badly damaged that she basically was left abandoned. And they were like, we're not, it's not even worth our time recollecting this ship. It's a wreck. But where one person sees a wreck, another saw an opportunity and the Amazon was bought and sold to an American whose name was Richard Haynes from New York for $1,750, which I looked up the conversion to today's money is $40,000 in America in today's money. And I'm pretty sure Richard Haynes is like the type of person who's just like, I now want to own a boat and you will call me captain because um, <laughs> he made himself captain and I don't think he knew much about ships. Um, yes, Haynes renames the ship the Mary Celeste, so we have him to thank for that. But Haynes was not good with his money. Um, and that is evidence in the fact that he bought a ship for that much money and then couldn't pay for it. And so it was seized by creditors, and then the ship was passed through many hands in till 1872, and it underwent $10,000 of a facelift. Which are, of course, true nautical terms, of course. Um, and <laughs> in, see, this is, I think I'm funny. Um, and in <laughs> 18, <laughs> in 
in I think you're funny too. I was the one that laughed. You. I know, I know, I know. But I wrote that like, you know, sometimes I write things for you. Sometimes I write things for myself and that was for myself. I'm just glad you laughed. <laughs> In 1872, after all of the, you know, renovations and work on the Mary Celeste were done, Benjamin S. Briggs becomes the Mary Celeste's captain. And Benjamin is an interesting man. His background's not necessarily pertinent to the story, but because he does go missing, I thought it would be interesting to tell you about him. He was one of five sons. His dad was a sea captain, and it said that four of the sons, including Benjamin, all went into the business, only one went elsewhere. So he was born into the business, very naturally followed his in his father's footsteps. He was an observant Catholic whose dating profile would have read, the favorite book is, my favorite book is the Bible. And he then went on to marry his cousin. Ah, uh, first cousin, second cousin. First, first, Sarah Elizabeth oh, Cobb. No. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's his so cousin. Much worse. It was it's 1862. Good, but. So I don't know if that was like the norm, but I feel like no one objected at the altar and was like, hey, Benji, don't marry your cousin. They kind of just were like, yeah, Benji and Sarah. <sighs> I just made up that nickname. I don't think that was his nickname. But yeah, so he married his cousin and okay. he and Sarah had two children a son named Arthur in 1865 and a daughter named Sophia in 1870. Benjamin invested his money into the Mary Celeste and then was set to travel to Genoa, Italy in 1872. He arranged for Sarah and their infant daughter, Sophia to travel with him along with the seven members of his crew. And that Arthur, because he was in, you know, preschool or schooling age would stay behind with Benjamin's grandmother. Then Benjamin hand selects his crew of, in quotes, this was like people remarked that it was a peaceable and first class sailors. And um, on October 20th, 1872, Briggs loaded the ship with 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol, which I looked up. It's basically poisonous alcohol that's used as fuel. So like you can't drink that stuff. Oh. It's fuel. How, how do you make alcohol... Not not a question for this podcast. Not a question the for this podcast. No, no. I was going to say, don't oh. ask me that. <laughs> oh, you went, and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, 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 no. I do not know. It's okay. I do not know. We'll move on. We'll move on. Okay, so they load up the Mary Celeste with all this stuff, and then a week later, Sarah and Sophia joined him, and they were all set to sail on November 5th. But the weather was uncertain and Briggs, being a good captain, was like, you know what? Let's wait until the bad weather passes. I want to be as safe as possible. Let's just wait. So they wait two days and Sarah used these two days to write a letter to her mother. And little did she know or the world know that this would be her final correspondence. She wrote, tell Arthur I make great dependence on the letters I shall get from him and will try to remember anything that happens on the voyage, which he would be pleased to hear. It just, like, breaks my heart. So sad. Yeah. Um, in a nearby harbor, the ship De Gracia was awaiting their petroleum cargo. So they, too, were destined for Genoa. So both Mary Celeste and De Gracia are both heading to Genoa. De Gracia was leaving the Hoboken port, and then Mary Celeste was leaving the New York harbor. And the De Gracia was, like, a couple days behind the Mary Celeste in terms of plans. Okay. So... The Mary Celeste set sail on November seventh. The same, the same path, basically the same path. That's yeah. why they happened upon them. Okay, yeah. So the Mary Celeste set sail on November seventh, eighteen seventy two, and the De Gracia set sail on November fifteenth, eighteen seventy two. What happened aboard the Mary Celeste between November seventh and December fourth is unclear, but on December fourth, the De Gracia had reached a position midway between Azores and the coast of Portugal when Captain Morehouse was notified of a vessel six miles away heading unsteadily in their direction. Morehouse observed the ship for a while, noting it was making erratic movements, and with the help of a telescope, he made note that there was no one aboard that he could see. He tried to make contact and signal to the Mary Celeste, but nothing. So he sent his first mate and another crew member over to investigate, 
and they climbed aboard and found the ship altogether deserted. The sails were set, but some were missing. Others were in bad condition. The ropes were hanging off the ship and the ringing was damaged. And the small lifeboat was missing. Plus, the glass cover of the ship's compass had been broken and there was a small but not alarming amount of water in the hold. The cabins were mostly in order. Briggs' sheath sword was under his bed, untouched, but most of the ship's papers were missing along with navigational equipment. There were ample provisions aboard and there were sign and there were no signs of fire or of violence. Like there was just no indication of why this crew is missing. The last right, log and the captain's like was there I don't know, I was just thinking like was there this crazy storm that they were thinking was going to hit so they panicked and got into a lifeboat and then ended up lost at sea and but drowning? a lifeboat would be way worse to be in during a storm than the ship right like that doesn't make sense yeah true i don't know so morehouse captain morehouse from de Grazia and his crew find the captain's log and the last log was dated november 25th and stated no concern it placed mary celeste 400 miles from where the de Grazia discovered her so for all intents and purposes, this missing crew was just a complete and utter mystery. But this is interesting because instead of looking for the missing crew, Captain Morehouse was like, hey, there's a lot of goods, a lot of fuel on this ship, a lot of booty, if you will. And if I bring it to shore, I can make some sweet cash monies. Because apparently there's like some maritime law that if you bring the goods of another ship to a port, like you can make money off of it. So if you happen upon someone else's treasure, you just get to steal it and sell it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can like pirate it in that way, but the fact that the ship was empty and they were bringing it back to shore, they could make money off of it. Hmm. I don't know. It seems a little sketchy and there's some conspiracies that they're like Morehouse, mm -hmm. you know, killed everyone, but... But he also had his own ship of goods. So like, what? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, maybe and, and maybe because there wasn't many details about Morehouse. It kind of just read as if like he discovered the crew was missing. It was a mystery. But hey, here's some money. And that's also probably me reading into it a little bit because I think people are evil. Um, so anyway, Morehouse, Morehouse brings the ship into Gibraltar and he wrote to his wife saying, I shall be well paid for the Mary Celeste. And I don't think he wrote anything about, like, those poor souls who went missing. It was more like, I'm going to get the monies. So yeah. once Mary Celeste reached the shore, an investigation began, and they determined foul play must have been at play because they sent a team aboard to, to search the ship. The surveyor noted cuts on each side of the bow caused seemingly by a sharp instrument, and there were possibly traces of blood on Briggs' sword. So the report also emphasized that there was no sign of heavy weather and there was speculation. This is interesting. Okay, so there was speculation. I, I couldn't find confirmations that any of the poisonous alcohol was open, but there was speculation that the crew drank the alcohol that was poisonous and murdered the Briggs family in a drunken frenzy and then to cover up their actions, faked a collision doctored their logs and fled but if you murder three people on a boat there would be evidence there would be blood and this was like there were maybe traces of blood on the sword it was kind of like they were looking for an explanation because there was no explanation yeah others uh, yeah, believe there just... was yeah it's such a mystery seems seems a bit odd right Others believe there was a greater conspiracy at play, murder, cover-up, maybe it was Morehouse, maybe it was insurance fraud. Then, you know, the the supernatural theories like giant octopi, aliens, or pirates, the theories go on and on. Some even blamed Morehouse and the crew of De Grazia that Morehouse had lured them in and killed the Briggs family and the entire crew in order to get money for the supplies aboard the ship. Some also theorized that Briggs and Morehouse were actually working together. But if that were the case, then where did Briggs and his family go? And why would he abandon his son, who was, like, back in the States with his grandmother? It It's just very confusing. 
And also, and also the De Grazia left after Mary Celeste. So timing wise, it doesn't make sense that Morehouse would have lured them. Like they, it truly, like the Mary Celeste was days ahead of them in the voyage. And it was only because it was abandoned that it was drifting ashore and it, and they ended up finding it. And to just the evidence, like, let's say that the crew did get really drunk off of this poisonous alcohol and were essentially mm-hmm. like poisoned. If they were acting that erratically, it wouldn't make sense for their cabins to still be like really well kept yes. and tidy and basically like pristine. Yes. And really the only thing to have happened was for the navigation compass to be cracked with a small amount of water and for everyone to be missing. And yes. I guess like – some ropes and stuff are are around, but yeah, I don't know. So it's, there it's, is there is one theory that sadly is not supernatural in any way, and I, I I think I believe it the most, and I'll get to it in a minute. But um, it is. I mean, it it's a it's a mystery, and the fact that and it's also sad because mm-hmm. clearly they had fled in this lifeboat, but then never made it to safety. Right. So I, it's sad to imagine what those days were like for them and how and and what they went through. And imagine having a newborn baby doing with doing that too. Like it just I always think of well now yellow jackets kind of has this theme in it, but like I kind of think there's a book of people who like are abandoned and at sea and the idea of having to eat others to survive. Like I just imagine they I, yeah, I wonder what happened those days on the boat. I know. Well, and the fact that it was never, I mean, I guess the sea is huge and where they disappeared, yeah. there's really like not much around. But just the fact that there was there was nothing ever found. Again. Nothing. Like, no nothing. trace of them or not the at all. boat or anything. Like no one, it's just nothing. gone. Taken to the sea. I mean, that's the, the crazy. Whatever happened. That's the scariest part about the ocean is that it's so vast that there are so many things that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean that we will just truly never know and we'll never know the truth of what happened to them. Um, yeah, I know. It's scary. I hate looking at the image of Earth from the side that's all water. <laughs> I know. It's scary. It scares me. Okay. So then there was also a belief that perhaps pirates off the coast of Morocco had attacked the Mary Celeste, but like, listen – a pirate group wouldn't just hey, say like, hey, there's a ship. Let's go kill everyone and then leave all the valuables behind. Like their cabins were all untouched. The mm-hmm. fuel, the alcohol, poisonous alcohol was all left there. Like they could have brought food it back. Too. Like, yeah, all the food. If they, you're in the middle of the ocean, wouldn't anything. you at least take some of the food? Yeah, yeah. So that theory doesn't make sense to me and a lot of other people in the world. Um it was also later determined that the lifeboat's rope was cut, not untied, which signifies a hurry to escape the ship. So oh. the theory that I most believe, and I think a lot of people believe, is that there was perhaps a small explosion on board. Perhaps they thought the water damage was worse than it ended up being, and they thought the ship would sink, and so they like ran as quickly as possible, not realizing that the ship would be fine after it. Because yeah, in 2006... An experiment was performed to test the explosion theory, and they created an explosion with similar 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 fuel that created a considerable blast and a ball of flame, but did not create a fire, left no soot, no scorching or burning, which means that a plaus- that they, which means that is a plausible explanation, and would mean Briggs and his men fled so like i imagine like if they're working and all of a sudden a big fireball blasts out they would for sure cut the ropes to the lifeboat jump on real quick and like flee because they think the boat's going to explode but what they didn't realize right. is that this this specific type of explosion truly just created a fireball and like a vacuum seal pressure and then went out but also i feel like this still doesn't entirely make sense because I mean, maybe I'm I'm thinking – I've never been in that situation, so I can't say what people would really do. But what I picture happening is that you flee, you get onto the lifeboat, you go so far away to be in safety, and then you wait 
right there with your ship yeah. visible still to see if anything yeah. happens and knowing that you're on the path that other ships will be on because right. that is the traveled location so you will be found and happened yeah. upon if you just let yourself drift and like start rowing into nowhere you're gonna die yeah i do wonder though if like a couple people grabbed the lifeboat real quick but then it like flipped or something like you know something else could have happened in the panic in the chaos right. of it all that no one survived i don't know i don't know but that that's the one theory that seems like the most plausible to me because i think if i saw an explosive fireball of something crazy i would for sure jump off the boat yeah you know you know right. um so anyway, this mystery is something that's never really been solved and no one knows the answer because like you said, there's just no evidence of Briggs. There's no evidence of the crew members. There's just no trace of anyone. Um, and after the dis after the disappearance, the Mary Celeste went on to have other voyages, but she was a very, very unpopular ship because as she would be with this history, no one wanted her. No one wanted to be her captain. She seemed to be cursed. Another captain, I feel bad Edgar- for the boat. <laughs> Yeah. Another captain actually fell ill and died while on the boat, um, which is the third wow. captain to die on board. And then in November of 1884, the new owner, Gilman Parker, and a group of Boston shippers conspired insurance fraud together. And they basically, like on all the paperwork, said that the cargo was more was worth way more than it actually was. And then mm-hmm. Parker was sailing the ship in deliberately ran it into a reef in a channel by Ganov Island. I think that's how you say it. And uh, let's just say they did not get away with it. And they were very much caught in their scam. And one of his co-conspirators went crazy. Another took his own life. And it seems like the curse of the ship got them all after all. And then uh, when they, because they crashed it. So basically the Mary, Mary Celeste was lost to the sea. Um, the Mary Celeste was lost to the sea, as were the lives of Briggs, his family, and his crew. Their fate remains a mystery, and to this day, there is no confirmation of what actually happened to them. And this reminds me of the ship, I think you talked about it in the very first ships episode we did. Orang it's Madon. kind of, what? The Orang Madon? Was that the one where they all froze? I think so, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But there's a lot of ships in history that where the crew just went missing and there's no trace of them. No one knows what happened. Or there's just like all these weird conspiracies and mysteries that happen mm-hmm. out at sea that we just don't understand. Um, there are flying saucer theories. There are giant sea creature theories. There's also a theory that maybe they got lost in the Bermuda Triangle, which has been dismissed because the ship was so far away from where. So far away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think everyone, like anything, anything, any time anything happens at o- in the ocean, it's like, oh, the Bermuda Triangle. But it doesn't mean that these things are impossible. There are, were no evidence of aliens or sea monsters. But if I were an alien or a sea monster, I wouldn't leave evidence behind. So who knows? Um, there was also like eventually in time a man who claimed to be the survivor of the Mary Celeste. And he said that Benjamin Briggs challenged the first mate to a swimming race and they were both killed by a shark. And while the, <laughs> while the crew was watching this horrific thing happen, a freak wave came and hit the ship and everyone aboard fell off. And he claimed that he what? was the only one who did not drown. But let's just say that's, I mean, I believe aliens before I believe this man's theory. Well, because if that, if that theory is correct and he remained on the ship, why the hell would he ever opt to by himself get onto a lifeboat instead of stay on the ship with all of the food well and he, he was saying he would, there'd be some report of like him on the lifeboat getting back to shore yeah and being saved at a yeah. port well and and also he was saying that the a wave hit them all off that like like a freak wave hit the ship and they all flew off the boat and if that's the case then no one had time to cut the ropes to the lifeboat to get it off like get it in the ocean for them to use so yeah. It's yeah. Let's just say liar, he did liar, not. Pants on fire. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Um. So no one really knows what happened to the passengers of Mary Celeste. It is lost to the ocean now. Um, wow. This is more of a mystery than a supernatural ghost story, but it's still fascinating. 
Well, I mean, we don't know what happened. We'll never know. Maybe there's yes. something that it, if it does somehow come come out and a mystery is somehow solved, that we'll be like, oh, that was a weird series of events and this makes sense, but that's like a freak accident that happened. Yeah. But I also, I mean, this is a paranormal podcast, so I do like to think about the mysteries of the ocean and what could have happened. Yes. Like, what if sirens came up and everyone was all Ooh. entranced by these mermaids and got in their lifeboat to go yeah. say hello to the mermaids and then that just like you know like what what things could have happened in the sea Sorry, so many I we were on video i was literally like about to lift my shirt off <laughs> what things happened i'm, I'm a little sweaty i'm used to just like <laughs> stripping in front of you <laughs> Well, no, you're right because yeah. there's so much we don't know about the ocean. There's so many things that possibly could happen. Also, I love – I mean, I, it's sad, but I also am so fascinated by this idea of ghosts existing on the ocean floor. Yes. The ocean floor is so scary. So scary. So, so scary. deep. Just everything that's down there, the, the like drop-offs that are – larger than everest oh the creatures no. that we don't know that exist mm -mm. the weird like bloops and and noises that scientists have no idea what they're coming from <sighs> what's creating them it's it's bewildering but yeah that's you know, the story of mary celeste our marys at that, sea the marys mary's mystery it's a big one that's wild. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, the baby on board and just the fact that everybody is now missing and obviously yeah, dead. Yes. Yeah. It's so yeah. scary. I do – there's part of me that – like, I do hope – it's so uh, it's so conflicting, but the fact that no one survived, I do hope that they didn't have to spend days on a lifeboat without food and without supplies and then yeah, die. That would be terrible. You know, I, I do for the sake of – less pain almost wish that they died right away quickly yeah right that's like what is that what is that story they made a movie about it with shailene woodley in it oh yeah um, it was based on that the true story of that woman her and her boyfriend mm -hmm. yeah and she in the the panic and malnutrition and everything that was her basically being left alone on this boat for however many days or weeks it's like a, a imagine it's really him long to be there but yeah. he died right away which is which is yeah. good because can you imagine being detached from the boat in <sighs> a giant storm and then oh, no. surviving for some time i wouldn't even want to survive for two minutes if i were going to die i want to die immediately instantly yeah 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 listen to stories listen to stories oh that was beautiful corinne Oh, thank you. You're quite the vocalist. I'm not the greatest singer, but I enjoy doing it. You could be a siren. So, yeah. Oh, <laughs> the siren of the sky. When you project me in my little worming situation, I'll just sing a song <laughs> for all to hear. For all this to hear. And everyone becomes mesmerized and like possessed and follows you out yeah. like zombies into this town square into the town square and then everyone does the monster mash that's what i make we do everyone the mash. do i love it <laughs> we do there the for monster it. Mash. this is reminding me of do you remember i think it was two years ago when one of those <laughs> do i remember two I, years I ago have no. no idea well there was an artist who had created that animated cartoon of the two ghosts that are singing it's like doo -doo -doo. oh yeah that was really cute doo -doo -doo. the like romantic yeah 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 that was sweet it's i think we so, reposted it that it was, so was mesmerizing that was yes i think i probably watched it on loop at least 90 times <sighs> for sure i liked that a lot okay i have an email and this is from dana and marianne Hey, ladies, I just finished the ghost ship episode and my mom was listening with me. Once she heard you both talking about the Queen Mary, she told me that I had to email you. Yes. So with that being said, this isn't my personal experience, but my mom's when she worked on the Queen Mary. 
She worked she started there? working on the Queen Mary. Yes. 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 This was – she. they emailed because of our first ships episode when we read a listener story wow. about Queen Mary. I love that. She started working on the Queen Mary, I believe, in the 1980s. She didn't say. And she worked in the restaurant. The lady that she saw multiple times was the lady from the salon. One night, my mom was working in the restaurant when she saw a lady sitting in another server section in the very back booth. So my mom goes up to the server, let's call the server Janet, and asks Janet why she hasn't served that person, why she's about to leave. And my mom told her that someone was sitting in her section. So Janet laughs and says, Marianne, nobody is sitting in my section. You're crazy. My My mom saw that lady sitting at the table, get up and walk out of the restaurant. Later that night, she went up to the office for her cash up and saw a foot and saw a photo of that woman. She asked her manager who it was, and he said that she had died years ago. Oh my, my gosh. mom was shocked. She said, No, I just saw that woman in the restaurant. And the manager turned around, big eyed, looked at my mom and said, Marianne, you saw a ghost. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right then. <laughs> My mom knew that she had a gift. She knew since she was little, but she didn't quite believe it until this moment. Wow. Ready for the next experience? The little girl at the pool. Yeah. She saw her as well. Wow. My mom was going to the restroom before her shift so so that she could finish getting ready. And when she was doing that, a little girl walked into the restroom. My mom said, hi, sweetie. Are you lost? And the little girl said back, Hi, no, I'm okay, ma'am. I just like being by the pool. My mom didn't think anything of it until she left and didn't see where the little girl went. Once again, my mom told her coworkers, and they laughed and said no children have been on this boat all morning. Then she read later on about the little girl who haunts the pool. She was blown away. None of the experiences that she had were harmful, and she wasn't scared. She felt safe every single time. Well, I hope you enjoyed the story, and I will see you on the other side. My mom will be so stoked if this is read. Moms being moms. Oh, Dana and Marianne. This is amazing. I mean, it does sound like from your definition or your story about the Queen Mary and from this email, like that the spirits aren't negative. Like they they are all just kind of coexisting within the yeah. ship. I am right. curious, though, why yeah. the manager had that photo of the woman. Like, who who was she to the manager? I'm not sure. I guess I sort of pictured it as, as like, you know, like a good example of this is when we were at the Driscoll and there's just like portraits and old historic yeah, things yeah, decorating the true. halls and the offices. So I was just yeah. picturing it more of that, like where she was near the office and was just like, oh, wait, that's the lady. Like maybe assuming, like, I think if I were in her position, I would just assume it, it was an oh one of the owners or investors yeah. or like someone important in some way. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I just saw that woman. Like, who is she to us again? And they're like, Mary that Ann, dead. you saw a ghost. You saw a ghost. She hasn't been alive for 38 years, Marianne. I, I had the, I, I don't know why I had this in my mind, but I imagine like, you know, a dressing room with a big mirror. And mm-hmm. for some reason, the manager works out of a dressing room in my imagination. And on the mirror is just one picture. And it's a picture of the woman who Marianne, Marianne <laughs> saw. That's what I was, that was what was in my head. But it's like a photo Wrong, booth strip. But- and it's just that one person <laughs> yeah. in a photo booth in all four By frames. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, do wonder, actually, I mean, that's Angie a good saw- question. I wonder if there have been any photo booths where ghosts have taken pictures. Like if I were a ghost, I would for sure get in a photo booth and take a lot of pictures. Right? It might be one of those mysteries where like I think if you're at like a wedding or something and there's just people that kind of like crowd in and you don't always know who's with you, I wonder how many have kind of like snuck into those photos. Yeah. Well, something I will do. We'll see. Well, it sounds like, I mean, compared to what – my tour guide at the Queen Mary went through with yeah. presumably the little girl in the pool that Marianne had a much better time because the little girl was just chilling and it was like, no, I just yeah. like hanging out here and not yeah. chasing yeah, her that's, around. Yeah, the chasing is scary. <laughs> yeah, I do. Marianne sounds so like she cool, has though. a lot of skills. Yeah, so cool. Yes. Okay. 
I have a story from our listener, Courtney, who also I think is a Patreon donor and commented, I sent you an email about a haunted ship and I was like swooping in. Perfect. Okay. It's called Super Spooky Battleship North Carolina. Hi, Sabrina and Corinne. I'm going to start this off by saying I love you guys, but I legitimately had to stop listening to the podcast last year because it spooked me too much and was overlapping (laughs) into my dreams. It made me sad, but then I decided to start listening again during quarantine because I figured what else could go wrong with 2020 at this point? Uh, I'm also a (laughs) hashtag Corona bride. I know I don't have to say more there. Yes, we, I know that. Well, I have had an interest in everything paranormal from a young age. I have realized over the years that I may be sensitive, but with my dreams. Hey, me too, Courtney. Already two things in common, Corona bride and dreams. It's a strange gift that I am sure my parents both have as well. We have all had very strange dreams and occurrences that happened later that were really hard to explain. I'll send a different email with those later. But back to Battleship North Carolina. If you haven't been, I would highly suggest it. It has some very heavy energy, but I surprisingly never felt scared there. There's also a book called Ghosts of the Battleship North Carolina written by the ship's caretaker that was crazy to read. However, my first time visiting, I was maybe 9 or 10 years old, and I didn't know any of the spooky history. I thought it was just another historic thing my dad was dragging my mom and I to. It was in the middle of August that we visited, so it was insanely hot as we toured it. Every time since I have visited, the ship has been crowded, but for some reason, the first time we went, we lucked out and there were very few other people touring. Being that young and not super interested in the history aspect, I was bored and sweaty, standing there watching my dad read all the plaques. My mom felt the same way, so we both just hung back from him and let him explore. We got to this area that I don't know what it's called, but I googled photos and attached them to help better describe. They aren't mine, but you get the idea. It feels very deep in the ship, and the smell of gunpowder is still very much present in the air. My mom and I were walking up the stairs, and there was someone walking behind me. The person was walking pretty closely, and I remember feeling annoyed because they wouldn't just walk around us. We also didn't really encounter many other people while touring the ship, so the fact that they were walking so so closely to us when it wasn't even crowded stuck out to me. Finally, we got to the top of the stairs, and this person walked to my left and went around us. I glanced over my shoulder and saw the person was dressed all in khaki, briskly carrying on past us. Long story short, it took us years to realize, but it seems to me that I might have seen one of the crew members rushing off to action on the ship. I was able to find some images of World War II naval uniforms, and there are khaki ones that bear a very close resemblance. Neither of my parents remember that man, but they remembered me talking about the person who was rushing us and walking closely. I think whether or not I knew it at the time, this is where my interest for the paranormal sparked. And of course, I haven't been lucky, or I guess unlucky enough to see anything since, at least that I know of. Thank you for reading and for your hard work with the podcast. See you on the other side, Courtney. And here are just two pictures of the ship. Oh my gosh. Oh, that is so cool. This feels like time travel, doesn't it? This feels like Glitch in the Matrix. It is. Because of just the scenario and them being rushed and him being there. It feels like you happened upon... A time slip almost. I know. I am but it's curious just the spirit, though. Like going about. But did the spirit like what was the spirit's experience? Did he was he like, who are these two people on my ship walking so slowly? I have things to do. I have places to be. Or did he not really I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he right. waited until they were at the top of the stairs to pass them. So it does feel like he knew they were there. Yeah, that is interesting. It's almost making me wonder if it's some sort of like from his vision, if there's some sort of warped perception of who they are. Like, do they appear to be people? Who they are? Yeah. Yeah. Are they like in the wrong time period, clothing wise and looks wise? Or is there some sort of like weird shift where they take on the appearance of people who were supposed to be there and that's why he's just kind of like, you know, not super anything to see these people from so many decades later. Yeah. I'm also curious, like if you're a spirit who lives 
or exists on the battleship North Carolina or any ship really or anywhere, do you get used to seeing people touring? Like, do you know, like, is this the norm to you or is it weird continuously? This is why I wish we could interview a ghost. Right. Like, does the experience reset every day? Like, do you wake up every day and you're shocked at what's happening around you? (laughs) Or is it one of those things where I know we've read listener stories before of people who've worked at haunted places or just have toured yeah. haunted places where like the ghosts actually do have somewhat of an attachment to the people that are the tour guides right i don't know and enjoy certain ones and have like favorite people yeah like <laughs> their friends there yeah right so many it's questions curious. very very few answers so many yeah you know, if one of us ever passes before the other, which I hope never happens, I hope we die at the exact same second. <gasps> Holding hands in our but not, old age. But like, yeah, I was going to say almost almost not together because that makes me think that it would be like a car accident or something. Like it needs to be separate. Like we just no, at Karen, the same time. We will, like we will both be space. ill and we'll, we'll drive – we'll have someone drive us to meet in the middle or meet wherever we want to be ghosts. We'll, we'll meet at the Queen Mary – and we'll be laid Area to rest. Area 51. <laughs> yeah, Area 50. Wait. It's brilliant. That is we a brilliant idea. We would get to see everything. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, fine. On our deathbeds, we'll have someone drive us to Area 51. We'll just be on the border of it. And you and I will lay there and take our final breaths. And we'll look at each other with a big grin on our faces and be like, hee, 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 ha, and then we'll find all the answers and then we'll start a new podcast yes. called Two Ghosts, All the Answers. Two Ghosts on Area 51. I wonder Fun. if anyone's ever tried to hot balloon, hot air balloon over Area 51. I doubt it. I think it's a no-fly zone. It definitely is. I just wonder how far you'd get in if they'd chew you or if they'd be like, <laughs> stupid idiot. Uh, and just let you I'm kind of not float willing to try me neither but if you've ever uh ventured upon hot area 51 <laughs> oh yeah if you've ever hot air balloon on area 51 or if you ever try it <laughs> please email us your experience also email us about anything paranormal supernatural weird spooky strange um send your emails to two girls one goes podcast at gmail.com you can also share them live with us on spotify live we have a show called campfire stories every tuesday 5 p.m pacific 8 p.m eastern Come join us and share your stories live. If you want to see our faces as we tell you these tales, we have a YouTube. And as of June 1st, we will be posting everything on there. So this will be be up there in a a blip. You'll be able to watch this. Yeah. We also have Patreon. We go live on Patreon every month for certain tiers. And there's also a lot of other cool things on Patreon uh, like – Two girls want to go ring tones, exclusive merch. If we Discord. perhaps do some live shows in the future, you'd get early yeah. access to tickets. Yep. Lots of fun things. Great fun things. Um, join our triangle. It's basically a pyramid scheme where you can get lost in spooky things. You tell all your friends about it, and next thing you know, you um are in uh not I wouldn't say a cult necessarily, but cult adjacent situation it, it's, it's just a yeah. communal haunting and everyone enjoys yeah. it and everyone loves it you must right? love it yes um thank you to Couldn't everyone who supports us on patreon thank you so much to our editors aiden manning eric foster the whole team at fr digital we are so grateful for all the work that you put into this and making us sound and look better now that we're on youtube um and thank you and thank you to all of you us. Yeah. Our community, love our phantoms. You. Our pyramid. Love you. We love you. And we will see you. See you on, on the, the other, other side. side.